Are you ready? ready. All right. The topic today we're going to start with this morning is the slit lamp exam. Now, everyone in this room uses the slit lamp microscope on a daily basis to look at the eyes, and yet I'm betting you've never had a formal lecture on this topic. And in fact, I was the same way. When I started off my uh, eye career as a young medical student, I kind of felt like I was just thrown in a clinic and told to sort of, <laughs> to sort of sink or swim, so to speak, in order to figure out how to use the microscope. I had no idea what I was doing, and it took several months of me working <laughs> to... Uh, to figure out how to use the microscope. And so I thought maybe we could try to uh, learn a little bit more about the microscope that we're using on a daily basis and try to do this in an interesting way. And so here's the plan. We're going to begin by constructing a microscope from scratch. Then we're going to learn how to use a modern microscope that we use on a daily basis. Then we're going to learn the eight things that we look at when we do the eye exam. But we're going to start by using a model to do that. We'll move on to real life eye exams and some common findings. And finally, we're going to end on some common uh, and some advanced filter techniques that you maybe have never used before. So, sound good? Yep. Let's do it. And let's begin by building a microscope. Now, the eye, as we know, is a very small structure. It's about one inch in diameter. And, in fact, the part of the eye that we look at, the interior segment, is even smaller than that. So we really need a microscope to see what we're doing. We don't need a high-powered microscope. We're not looking at individual cells, but we certainly need one. But our patients, they don't like to lay flat. They like to sit up. And so we need to take a microscope <laughs> and, uh, and move it so it's in a horizontal axis so that we can look at the eye. And so that's what we're doing. Let's improve our design by creating a binocular microscope, two of them. But let's meld these together into a single unit so that they're in focus and synchrony with each other. And this is basically the perfect microscope. So far, so good. <laughs> now we need a light source. Early microscopes use the sunlight or even flame, a candle, to look at the eye, but it's just not enough light, and as we know, the eye is sensitive to flame. So with the invention of electricity and the light bulb, we improve our design and start using a light bulb to see what we're doing. But once again, not ideal, but what if we improve our light, put in some type of housing so that it's very bright. In fact, we can even focus our light using a lens in the front. It adds some filters onto the light in order to uh, look at different structures in the eye. And we can even put barn doors so we can create a slit of light, a, a beam of light. And this is a better way to look at the eye. And now we have basically an excellent light source. So we have a perfect microscope, a perfect light source. But how do we use these things in synchrony with each other? Because it's very hard to focus them independently. Well, you can put them on a bar so that they're in focus at the same point at all times. And this works great. But it's hard to stabilize this and hold it. So let's put it on a tripod. This is much better, nice and stable, very little movement, but we can probably improve our design a little bit more by adding some type of uh, wheels to the bottom of our tripod. And so now it moves around and we can really move in and focus in on our eye. Now our only last thing we need to do is right now our light is stuck. It can't move in relationship to our microscope. But what if we created some type of hinge mechanism so that we could move the light in relation to our scope and they still be in focus at the same point? This is basically the perfect modern microscope. And if we look at a modern microscope, this is exactly what we see. There's a microscopic component to it, there's a light source on some type of swivel device, and finally there's a tripod, a base that moves as well. This is all very basic for this crowd, but it lays down the basics. Now, different manufacturers make different styles of microscopes. This is the Hogstrite that I learned on, and you may have in your own uh, clinic. The light is above shoots down through various filters and lenses and strikes a mirror before hitting the surface of the eye. The only problem I have with this particular model is that the light column is so large and the controls are so spread out that it's a lot of work. You're constantly reaching above your head to use it. This is a Zeiss. The light is down below and basically shoots through various prisms before focusing on the eye. I think this is a probably an improvement in design. The only problem with this scope is it's just so hard to use. The ergonomics are just terrible unless you're a, a human octopus. It just doesn't work well. Uh, this is the modern microscope that we use in all of our clinics. This is a version by Topcon, but many of the other manufacturers are making this style. The light is down below, which is nice, but all the controls are in one central location for controlling our light and our filters and uh, our various settings. But no matter what microscope you use, they all have the same basic principle in that there's a common rotational pivot point that they all work around in order to focus on the eye. Let's learn how to operate the microscope. And we'll start from the beginning as well. Of course, the first step is to get your eyepieces at the correct pupillary distance, and that's very easy. And then, of course, you set your diopter power uh, to your own eye. And for most of us here, it's probably set to zero. Use the magnification barrel. I like to work in the lowest magnification for the entire exam. I don't really need higher mag. 
Um, then you need to learn how to turn your light on. There's usually an on button on our central console here. Underneath the table itself, there's usually another on button. And then you need to track down the rheostat, and that controls the actual intensity of light. And it's often under the table, but sometimes, at least on this unit, it's actually on the base itself, which is quite convenient. We need to familiarize ourselves with the various knobs and dials. These are all in the same place, but one knob controls the width of light, which is probably the most useful control on our entire uh, assembly here. Uh, another one controls the height, not nearly as useful, but it is very helpful when measuring the size of objects. And then we need to find our various filters, and we'll cycle through these as well. And we're going to talk about this near the end of this particular lecture. But you can see here we've got green, white, and of course the blue light, which we use most often. Positioning. Now, we've been trained from a customer service standpoint to always put your patient first as far as comfort. But when it comes to the slit lamp exam, your Comfort is actually more important, I think. If you think about it, a patient is an exam once or twice a year. You're doing this three or 4,000 times a year. And talk about repetitive stress injury. So when you start with positioning, make yourself comfortable before you make your patient comfortable. So that means setting the seat where you want to sit. Once that's set, then you can set the <laughs> microscope at the height that you like. And there's usually a locking mechanism here to the side. And only then, only then do you start worrying about the patient and set the patient where they're comfortable as well. We can raise the chair here. And of course, our goal is to get our patient's forehead against that bar, chin on the chin rest. And you want to line up the lateral canthus of the eye with that black mark in order to get the maximal excursion and get them doing well. The patient can grab onto the side of the table or the side of the microscope here. Occasionally, you'll have a, a chubby patient with a very large abdomen, very hard to get up to the microscope. And I find it helpful to make the microscope very low and far away for them so they can rotate down and into it. And you'll notice here that I'm pushing on the back. I'm not pushing on the head here. It's a lot safer to push on the middle of the back. Uh, you'll get better chin position, and it's just safer. Occasionally, maybe one time a year, I'll have a patient who actually does better standing up to get to the microscope. And of course, with children, they're very limber. Um, but they have short torsos, and so it's helpful to have them get on their knees and then get up to the microscope that way, and a lot of kids do great with this. All right, let's move on to the exam itself. We all know how to use a microscope by now, but what about the actual exam? There are eight findings that we look at in the front part of the eye. We're not going to talk about retina, just the front. Eight findings. I call these the Ocho. El Ocho, not to be confused with El Nino. But anyway, eight findings. But instead of reading these out and talking about them, let's take a look at all these findings, first starting with a model. And then we'll move on to some live patients, and we'll look at those findings once again. So we're going to move on to a different model, uh, something that's a little bit more anatomically correct. And we always start with the external eye disease. And we look at the cheek, we look at the nose, we look at the brow, things around the eye that might cause ocular problems or be related. Moving on to our lids and lashes, you always look at the lid margin. And you look at your lash line, of course, as well. Moving on to the conjunctiva and sclera, the white part of the eye. Uh, white and quiet here. We'll go over this in a little bit more detail in a bit. And then we move on to, of course, to the cornea. Now, the cornea is that clear window in the front part of the eye. We're going to switch to a different model to make it a little bit easier to see. And clear structures like the cornea really is where the slit lamp comes of age because you can get a cross-sectional beam and look at that cornea in fine detail. And here you can see the beam is coming in from the left. And if you look closely, you can see the front of the cornea. You can look at the back of the cornea. You can look at the middle part of the cornea. And it's really nice to have that cross-section because it lets you track down lesions. Now, I've stuck two lesions to this model. But are they on the outside of the cornea? Are they on the inside of the cornea? Well, we can actually use our slit beam to tell. And if we go across, you can see that the front light's up here. And if we go over to the other one, we can see it lights up on the back surface of the cornea. And so a very good way to judge depth and to judge the location of lesions by using our cross-sectional beam and moving on to the back. OK, let's move on to the um, anterior s chamber, basically. And that's the fluid-filled space between the back of the cornea and the surface of the iris. So I'm going to fill it up with some water here just to make it a little bit easier for us to visualize. And in fact, let's, uh, let's put some inflammatory cells in here as well and just make it a little bit easier to see. And when you're looking at the anterior chamber, I find it helpful to angle my beam so that strikes the back of the cornea to the left and the iris surface to the right and using the pupil as a black background, it makes it a lot easier to see things floating in that space. And so you can see it a lot easier if you use that black background as opposed to the very illuminated iris. If you have enough inflammation, it's quite easy to see. In fact, if you have enough inflammatory cells, they sink and they'll form a layer of pus in the bottom of the anterior chamber. And this is, of course, what we call a hypopian. Change that to red blood cells, and this is what we call a hyphema, or bleeding in the bottom part of the eye. Okay. 
Moving on to the iris, by far the easiest part of the eye to look at because it's flat and therefore always in focus and there's usually not that much pathology on it quite frankly. Um, behind the iris is the lens and because it sits behind there you can only see it by looking through the pupil. And the lens is another clear structure just like the cornea is and because of that we can use our cross-sectional beam to look at it in the exact same way. So if we zoom in here you can actually see the, uh, the front of the lens here and the back of the lens is here and the part in between is the lens nucleus, that's where people mostly develop their cataract. Behind the lens, of course, is the vitreous cavity, and it mostly looks dark because for the most part it's optically empty. But it's not truly empty. As we know, the vitreous is filled with a clear fluid, very much like jello or jello dessert. Um, but unless there's red blood cells, some type of retinal detachment, for the most part it looks like a dark space, at least with the anterior eye exam. And if we close it, you can see it's quite dark inside there. Okay, so the eight structures, El Ocho, we learned it on the eye model. Let's move on to a normal eye, and we'll repeat ourselves and see what normal looks like. Once again, we start with our external exam, looking around the eye. So we're going to look at the brow above, sweep across, we look at the nose, and looking down at the cheek, everything looks normal here. Look at our lids and lashes, we've got our lid margins, and we look at our lash line with the normal limits here, some makeup in the corner, but that looks fine. I always flip the lower eyelid down, make sure there's no lesions there, and if they have symptoms, I'll often flip the upper, but always the lower since it's so darn easy to see. The conjunctive and sclera, the surface conjunctival vessels, and the sclera, I have my patient look up, down, left, and right, so we don't miss anything. And then we look, of course, at the cornea, I make a very thin slit of light, go across, looks clear here, no problems. The anterior chamber, I make my beam shorter, a little bit wider, use the pupil as a black background, it looks deep and quiet. Then we move on to the iris. And the iris, of course, is the easiest part to look at. You can even bump your magnification up if you want, but not a whole lot of pathology usually on the iris. Looking at our lens, once again, we make a very thin slit beam so we can look at this clear structure. And if we look here, we can actually see the front and the back of the lens, and behind that is the vitreous, which just looks like a dark cavity back there unless there's other issues. Okay, let's look at these eight structures once again, but now with a whole bunch of pathology. Now, I'm gonna shoot out a whole bunch of videos in very quick succession here. The actual fine details of this are, do not matter. This is more of an image recognition, just so you can realize what kind of things you can see abnormally. It started external. This is Hutchinson's sign, a lesion, what you see with shingles on a nose that indicates a higher probability of eye issues. This is a brow abscess, a pimple gone bad, has created a pre-septal uh, cellulitis. And this is a necrotizing ulcer. I believe this is a brown recluse spider causing necrosis here. At first glance, these lids and lashes look normal, but if you look at the sheer length of these lashes, this is a patient that's been on Zalatan for many years and has the lash growth that some people like. Collarettes, scurf, and junk on the base of the eyelashes, you see this with anterior blepharitis. This is a case more of a posterior blepharitis where the meibomian glands become clogged up and when we push with our Q-tip, you can see that whitish oily material just kind of oozing out, causing a lot of issues. Why do I flip the eyelid? Because sometimes you have things like pyogenic granulomas, which is associated with chalazians. We'll look at the upper lid. Here's another lesion. This is a, um, some type of granuloma. We biopsy it, end up being sarcoidosis, and we diagnose that disease process. Looking at the conjunctiva and sclera, uh, the conjunctiva here has a very large cystic structure. It's benign because it's clear, and anytime you have something clear, you can always use your thin slit beam and get a good cross section and gauge depth a little bit closer. This is swelling over in the white part of the eye. Uh, this is chemosis, usually associated with allergy. You get a very uh, puffy uh, allergic response. It look, can look quite impressive, but this looks even more impressive. This is a hemorrhagic chemosis. This is actually blood under the conjunctiva that's bulging forward, and it's really quite impressive how far forward the, the conjunctiva skin can bulge. Moving on to our cornea. This is a delin, an area of localized dryness that has caused thinning of the cornea right in this one little spot. Hydrate this and it thins, thickens back out again. This, of course, is a corneal ulcer, and it's thinning right in the middle. And we know it's thinning because look how clear it looks right in the middle of this lesion. And when we move our slit beam across it, just look at how thin it gets at that one spot. It ended up perforating a few days later. This is an experimental lens done about 15 years ago. It was put inside the cornea itself. And when we do our cross-section, you can see that dark gap right in the middle of the cornea, a very elegant way of looking at the cross-section. Very nice. This is something we see a little bit more often. This is a corneal infiltrate, probably related to contact lens use. And it's on the front of the cornea. You can kind of tell just the way that it, it lights up, uh, very amenable to antibiotics. This is KP splattered on the back of the cornea. And we know it's on the back of the cornea because we can use our slit beam once again. You can see how it lights up on the back surface. And you can even use retroillumination off the iris to see those dark spots by looking at the bright iris as a background. 
This is the anterior chamber, and we're looking at the anterior chamber. Make your light beam shorter, a little bit thicker, and turn the intensity as bright as you can. And you'll see cell and flare. Cell are individual cells floating in, the, in that potential space there. And flare is that sort of foggy appearance. It's from protein released from inflamed blood vessels. The brighter the light, the easier it's going to be seen. And if you use the pupil as a background, it makes it a lot easier. This is more flare, less cell, but you get the idea. You get enough inflammatory cells, they'll settle to the bottom, form that hypopian we looked at before. They can be sterile or infectious. This is probably from an infection from this tube shunt that uh, went bad. This is emulsified silicone oil. After a retinal detachment surgery, that silicone burped into the front part of the eye and silicone's lighter than water. It floated to the top and created almost an inverse hypopian. Blood is heavier than water, and so this is our hyphema, and it's sunken to the bottom of the interior chamber, and it's very easy to see here. And if you look closely, you can see there's two layers of blood, a fresh one on top, and you can see that's really plastered right up against the back of the cornea here. This is a resolving clot on the surface of the iris, and this is what we always worry about with bleeding in the eye, because days three to five, this clot starts to resorb, and you can get a rebleed. This is a melanoma on the surface of the iris, and if you look closely, you'll see sort of a pigmented rough right on the bottom edge of that pupil. This is what we call a tropian uvei, and this is the back of the iris, which is pigmented, is being pulled forward through the pupil onto the front of the eye just from contraction of this cancer on the surface. This is a, basically a hypertrophy at the sphincter muscle that controls pupil constriction. It just looks big and is giving this sort of a purse string appearance to the eye. Here's neovascularization of the iris. We always worry about this with our diabetic patients. It's one of our pertinent negatives. We always document. You can also see it after venous occlusions, and in this case, a sick eye. Here's the technique of retroillumination. We actually shoot a light straight through the pupil, bounce it off the surface of the retina, and you get that red reflex, and it actually shines through the iris, and you can see it as spoke-like um, illumination defects out here in the corner. You see it with pigment dispersion syndrome. You can also see something very similar to this with pseudoexfoliation where you have this dandruff-like material that forms on the surface of the lens, and as the iris constricts and dilates, it rubs off that pigment, and you can see these bindings. Our standard cataract, a 3 to 4 plus nuclear sclerotic, very yellow, very brunescent. Here's our terrible white mature cataract. Looks kind of mother of pearl. And here's our hypermature cataract, where the inner cortex is liquefied and turned white. The central nucleus has become so hard and brown, it's sunk into the bottom of the bag, and extremely hard case to manage. Here is an implant after a successful cataract surgery, and we know this is a multifocal implant because you can see these little concentric rings starting from the middle and moving our way out to help with distance and near vision. Here is our PCO, our after cataract is formed on the back of a completely normal lens. Very easy to use the YAG laser to get rid of that. This is the vitreous coming around a dislocated lens after trauma, and it has pigment stuck in it. It makes it a lot easier to see that jello back there as it's kind of peek forward in the front of the eye. Here's another case of vitreous, a big bubble of it right there in the anterior chamber with pigment stuck on it, little spots, makes it a lot easier to see this clear material. But normally when you look back there, what you'll see is something more like this. This is a vitreous detachment. You can see a, a, just sort of a sheet back there like a curtain, and that's just that vitreous jello contracting. And finally, this is a case of asteroid hyalosis, which is a calcium soap deposit that forms in the vitreous body, forms these little floating stars in there. They look impressive, but they don't cause a whole lot of visual problems for the most part, and they don't really indicate any real eye pathology. All right, now we just went through a ton of information. The final section for this little lecture is going to be on filters. Now we all know this uh, supervillain, yes? Well, this supervillain is going to introduce the blue filter. Now, the blue filter is useful not so much because it's blue, but because of its effect on fluorescein. And what is fluorescein? Fluorescein is a man-made organic substance that has a very unique characteristic in that it fluoresces. It's fluorescent, which just means that it will absorb light of one color, in this case blue, and it will emit light of a completely different color, in this case, a kind of a yellowish green. This has many applications, uh, environmental studies, uh, looking at hydrodynamics. It's also useful for tagging cells and cellular biology. But of course, we use it in the eye for looking at things like a corneal abrasion, which may be hard to see with the naked eye, even using a microscope. But raw areas will uptake this yellow material, and it'll glow under a blue light. I'll give you a better example here. Scratch on the surface of the eye, and that fluorescein sticks to that area and is very easy to see with a blue filter. It's also useful for finding leaks. This is a patient who has a corneal laceration, a nail through the eye, and we know it's a laceration because if you look at that, you can see a line going from the front of the cornea to the back. The question is, is it leaking or not? It's hard to tell just looking at it. So what do we do? We rub some fluorescein on the surface and you look for leaks, and this is a fluorescein strip, and you can see that leak right there where the fluorescein is being diluted and it's very obvious this is the Seidel test. This is a Seidel positive test, and you have to be careful. There are much higher risks for 
infection. The use that we use the blue filter, though, the most, of course, is when we do applination tonometry, which is when we light up our blue applination tip, we push it on the surface of the eye in order to estimate the internal ocular pressure. And the way it works is if you have a thin-walled sphere and you push on it with a certain amount of force, the amount of force you use and the area that becomes flattened, which we can measure by looking at our fluorescein Myers here, um, can be used to calculate the internal pressure inside that sphere. And that's exactly what we do when we are messing with the eye. We're pushing on the eye, and we're trying to flatten a circle on the surface of the cornea that is exactly 3.06 millimeters in diameter. So you're pushing and trying to get it 3.06 millimeters, and that's when you know you have it perfectly. Now, you're probably saying to yourself, this isn't what it looks like when I check pressure, right? Well, the reason why is there's actually a prism built into that tip that's already separated by 3.06 millimeters for you, such that when you get the inner meniscus lined up, you know you had the perfect size circle flattened. And once you had the perfect size circle flattened, our machine already has the calculation for figuring out the internal pressure inside the eye, and that's how we do it. Now, we know this superhero, yes? Well, he's going to introduce a filter that you probably don't use very often. This is the green filter. Now, we don't call it the green filter in medicine. We call it the red-free filter. And the reason why is because red light has a hard time passing through it. This is a red sheet, and you can see that red light bouncing off the sheet has a hard time getting through that red-free green filter. This is very interesting because if you can throw out all the red information, you can see a lot more structures in the eye. Looking at the retina, which is mostly red, if you throw out that redness, you can see the blood vessels much easier. They become darker. And you can actually see some other findings. If you look carefully, you can kind of see sort of a white striation pattern coming off the top of that nerve and fanning out like a fan. That's actually the nerve fiber layer running along the surface of the retina. And when people have glaucoma damage, <laughs> it's okay, you leave it. We got this one going. When, when people have glaucoma damage, is that nerve fiber that becomes damaged. And sometimes you can actually see a pattern of dark band right in the middle of that, which seems to correspond with any scotomas on their visual field. You can also use the red free filter when looking at the surface of the eye. Red lesions are much easier to see with this light. They become darker, they become black. In fact, you can even see the individual blood vessels coursing through the surface of the conjunctiva if you use this filter and you turn your magnification up enough. Probably the most interesting use for the red free filter is in cases of trauma. So if you have a kid who comes in who's been bopped in the eye and you're looking at their anterior chamber and they've got a lot of cell and you're asking yourself, is that, is that inflammatory cells? Is this an iritis? Or are these actually red blood cells, some type of microhyphema and I gotta worry about pressure spikes from rebleeds. Well, we can actually use our red free filter to figure this out. And to prove it to you, I've created a little diorama. This is basically a very bright light shining into a black box to simulate the inside of the eye. And inside this box, I have white and red balls to simulate white cells and red blood cells. And if we shoot red free light through this filter into that dark area, something very interesting happens. So white light and red free light the red balls seem to almost disappear. With no red light going into the eye, they can't bounce off those red cells back at us, and so they seem to disappear. A very elegant way to determine white cells, red cells, what is it? Sounds great in theory, it doesn't work that well, but what a neat idea. <laughs> so in summary, we have learned many things over the past 20, 25 minutes. We've constructed a slit lamp microscope. We have learned how to use a slit lamp microscope. We learned about the eight structures in the front of the eye looking at a model. Then we repeated this process looking at live patients. And finally, we learned about some advanced filter techniques. Now, I hope you found that interesting. And I hope the next time you use the slit lamp microscope, you don't feel quite as wet behind the ears as I did when I first started. <laughs> Very good. Thank you.